Michael Stevens, who is the assistant professor at the School of Library and Information Science, San Jose State University. Michael's been with us a number of times for I Lead You and on the front lines, and you are really in for a treat. So please help me welcome Michael. Thank you. All right, testing. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? How is this? All right, okay. Okay, so I lost my clicker. Is it okay to start? Oh, okay. All right, so we'll just, we'll just take a little breath here. I think it's good to take a breath. Yeah. Nice. How y'all doing? Good morning. I was delayed four hours last night, but that's all right. But I got here, I got here late. Okay, and who faces the Hilton? Like, I, did it look like there was nobody in the Hilton last night? Maybe it was just because it was so late, except there was this one room, all the lights were on, and the bed was askew, and it was stripped, and I thought, oh, this is weird. It's like, you know, watching a movie, like Rear Window or something. I'm like, what's going to happen? I stayed up a little later waiting to see what was nothing. We're like, zombie might come in or something. All right. <laughs> okay, we all right? Sure. Nice. I'm going to have a sip of this, uh, this good water. I appreciate this. Had a little tea. Um, things are good. Yes? Okay. Okay. Okay, all right. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'll, I'll be up here then. That's cool. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate being here. Uh, as you heard when I was introduced, I teach at San Jose State University in the School of Library and Information Science. This is our beautiful campus. We are 100% online. Yeah. So I live in the great state of Michigan. And that's where, where I came from yesterday. So I have, I have a super cool job. 
Uh, I teach in the state of California. I live in a very beautiful place. Uh, and this was our first full winter in northern Michigan. And we had a record 170 inches of snow. And I never thought you would have to shovel your roof, but that's something you do in northern Michigan. But it's been a good winter. And I'm glad to be here with you all sort of in what I would term a southern climate. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. OK, so we have some really cool stuff to talk about. And I will make sure I watch the, t the time as well. Um, we're going to talk about libraries evolving. And very specifically, we're going to talk about how library technology has evolved. And we're also going to talk about learning. Michael Buckland, who teaches at Berkeley in the Information School, many, many years ago said, there is much greater opportunity to bring service to wherever potential users of library service happen to be with new technologies. You know when he said this? 1992. Think about the technologies we had in 1992. That was three to four years before my public library, and I uh, worked as a public librarian in Indiana for 15 years. That was three to four years before we got the internet in our library. Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Think about the magical technologies that we have at our fingertips. Our tablets and our phones and all those uh, cool websites that do neat, neat things for us. And then there's this, Cognitive Surplus by Clay Shirky. Shirky talks a lot about technology and how people's time, use of time has changed and how sharing has changed. One of the interesting things he talks about is how we might approach the world, and I like to think how we might approach our institutions and what we do in our libraries uh, in this new landscape of technology. He says there are three ways that we can do this. The first one is as much chaos as we can stand. Hmm, nice. The second is traditionalist approval. And that's the way we've always done it, right? Oh, the website is a marketing tool. So it should go to the marketing department at the library. To me, that's not the way to do it. And a negotiated transaction. This is what I've advocated for for a long, long time. What do you think Shirky advocates for in the 21st century? Anyone? Chaos. Yeah. Chaos. Yes, absolutely as much chaos, and the key is, as we can stand. So something to think about in your jobs and in this wonderful work that you're going to do here is how much chaos can you stand? How much chaos can your team stand as you do this project? And individually, and this is a big deal, how much chaos can you stand? And what I would urge you to do is to push those boundaries. Because that's how we learn. I need to remind you, and we've talked a lot about technology already today, that technology is only a tool. It is not going to save us, and we heard that earlier today. We can't throw technology at our constituents and make everybody happy. But we also need to understand some other things that happen with technology. Techno lust is wanting technology because it's super sexy and oh so cool, right? We don't want to do that. Don't plan your projects because you're using sexy technology. Do your projects, use technology that fit the mission of what you're doing. Techno stress. How many more things can we have to learn about? How many more sites? How many more clicks do we have to do? Techno divorce. How do we let it go? How do we let go of things that don't work? <laughs> Techno shame. Ooh. There are some Illinois libraries that get all the big press, right? They're in the library journal, and people are talking about it, but what about us? That's an easy one to fix, because we can learn from all these great libraries, state, national, and globally. That, that's an easy one to turn around. Techno hesitation. Oh, no, we're not going to do technology X, because technology Y is coming. Oh, well, we almost started Y, but now Z's on the horizon. That's techno hesitation. Technophobia, I apologize for the spider. It's, it's bad, it's scary, that's what it's like. We'll keep going. Techno siege. Are you held captive by, forgive me, a governing body? 
Are you held captive by the IT department? Very quiet. All the lights will go up. Click. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's techno isolation. And this is when you feel in your position, in your institution, that you are alone. It might be because you're in a very rural area of the state. It might be because you haven't made connections with the other librarians, other library staff nearby. Last fall, I went to New Zealand to do a talk down there, very similar to this one. And I met people that had traveled hundreds of miles, hundreds of kilometers, to come to a conference, the big library conference in New Zealand. And they have tiny little libraries out in desolate areas. And it was so interesting to talk to them. So that's something we deal with uh, as well. So in the midst of all this, in the midst of all these ways we might approach technology, we have learning and how learning is evolving. I used the theory of transformative learning in my teaching and in my research. This is Mesereau. Uh, Mesereau says that for adult learners, that every time we encounter something new into our frame of reference, we expand it, and it changes our view of the world. And it is an active process involving thought, feelings, and disposition. I think that's really nice. I think that's a nice thing to think about. It's not just you're memorizing something, and then you're putting it back out there. It's much deeper than that. So when we talk about learning, we're talking about formal learning, such as this, staring out at a lecture hall where everybody has a laptop. <laughs> Informal learning that happens across the desk, or in the stacks, or in the cafe, or in the hallway of the school. It might be unexpected learning. And I had to throw this in here. I was just at the Public Library Association meeting a couple weeks ago. And uh, I met the librarian who did the Let's Butcher a Hog at the Public Library program. <laughs> Books and butchering, they called it. This is Johnson County in Kansas. People were just mesmerized by what it took to, and they had these really interesting people come in and do this. So learning can also be very unexpected. I apologize for the spider, and now I apologize for the carcass in my slides. OK, all right. Another way we learn is through curiosity. And that's that thing where maybe you do this yourself. Suddenly, oh, you're really interested in something. You saw something on TV or, or, or whatever. and then. You grab your iPad, you grab your second screen of choice, and you are suddenly learning about something, and you're following links, and suddenly 20 minutes have gone by. That kind of curiosity, I think that is some of the best learning that individuals can do. There are also new ways to learn. That might be uh, gamification. You may have heard that word. Uh, or gameful approaches to, uh, uh, to what we do in libraries. and. We also have a new generation of learners. Um, up north in the summertime, uh, we have really cool neighbors that are there in the summer. And we share our Wi-Fi with them. Don't tell anybody. Nobody tweet that. No tweeting. <laughs> and uh, I'll get in trouble with my provider. I look out the window, and there's little Ian. He's eight years old. He's like this. I said, Ian. I call out the window. Ooh, <laughs> what are you doing? And he says, I'm downloading apps. He's eight, and he's downloading apps. That's the world that he lives in. And that's the world that he's going to grow up in. And have you seen the video of the two-year-old whose father hands her an iPad, and in five minutes, she's mastered it? We're also facing some new challenges. This is the scary stuff. Forgive me. There's a, a Tumblr out there called the Librarian Shaming Tumblr. Has anybody seen this? OK. This went up. On, and this was somebody wrote this on a piece of paper and took a picture of it. I want to replace all librarians with tech people with great customer service skills and teaching ability. I want the library to have its own genius bar. Wow. That's, that's some heavy duty stuff. I just wrote about this in Library Journal. It went up. I'm so glad it went up right before I came out here. So, uh, we'll talk about this. We'll unpack this a little bit in the time that I have with you all. This is not a scary thing. This is not a negative thing. 
To me, this is a call to action for us to say, yeah, that's exactly what we need, and that's who we are. How many of you take a look at the Horizon Report when it comes out every spring? Okay, I would, if, you, if you're not raising your hand, put that on the list. Make a little note to check out the Horizon Report. Maybe it might even find its way into the discussions you have with your team. The Horizon Report is published every spring by the New Media Consortium and Educause, and they look at trends and technology impacting higher ed. But guess what? It's not just for the universities and the colleges. I think it's for everybody. And I think public librarians should be right there as well. This is 2013, the, the technologies that they see on the horizon. You may see some things that, that uh, you've talked about already, things that I'm going to talk about. There's two to three years, the Internet of Things, game-based learning is there. And then the four to five year things, the 3D printing, uh, wearable technology, et cetera. Here's this year's. They kind of cut it down a little bit. The flip classroom and learning analytics are one year out. Flip classroom is kind of doing that thing where you consume the lecture at home, and then you go to the classroom and you do hands-on. Learning analytics is understanding how people learn on a granular level. 3D printing, games and gamification. Very, very interesting, though, the quantified self my example of that as I reach into my pocket and pull out my Fitbit is this little device that counts my steps every day. And I've walked 3,269 steps so far today. So after this, I'll, be, I'll probably be doing loops out there because I want to get my count up. So that is the quantified self, how much we, we, we uh, record about ourselves and how much we stream out there. And finally, virtual assistants. If you've ever used Surrey on an iPhone, that's what that is. Really interesting example comes from uh, the ubiquitous librarian, Brian Matthews. He wrote a, uh, a column at uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education about a faculty member contacting him as university librarian for help. It wasn't help locating a resource, and it wasn't help with a new journal. It was finding the right WordPress theme for her course blog. And Brian wrote a really interesting meditation on what this means of, of the jobs and the roles and the expectations that folks may have of us in the future. And I think that was a really telling moment. Something else that comes from the Horizon Report is this, uh, this little phrase, this little sentence that really has resonated with me, especially if, as I moved a couple, three years ago to an entirely online uh, library education program. People expect to be able to work, learn, and study whenever and wherever they want to. The Horizon Report said that is going to be the way of the world for the future. That leads me to this, to the concept of learning everywhere. And that's the title of this talk today. There's a wonderful book, and this is another book I would recommend to you, and this might be something that you might read as a group. If you are doing any project, and I read over the abstracts of the projects to get ready for, for my time with you all today, if you're doing anything related to learning and how people learn and how people participate in learning activities, this might be a great book to read. And this is A New Culture of Learning by Thomas and Brown. And in this book, they say, their, their thesis or their question is, what happens when we move learning from the very rote 20th century reading, writing, arithmetic to the very fluid, participatory, social 21st century. What happens? What changes? They say information technology is a platform to share and network imaginations. And the world is changing faster than ever, and our skill sets have a shorter life. I can't teach my students how to blog. I need to teach them how to approach new technologies they haven't encountered, how to make sense of them, and how to apply them to what they do in their jobs. I can't just pick on specific tools. It has to be broader than that. And play. Play is the basis for cultivating imagination and innovation. And it was so nice early on today to hear you all be invited to experiment and explore and play throughout this process. I think that's absolutely 
wonderful. So I've been uh, teaching for a while. I've been teaching a class called the Hyperlink Library. It's a class I started at San Jose. And it's about technology, and it's about emerging technology. But I also want to say this, and I'll say it again, and I'll say it again. It is also about people, because people are hyperlinks too. And we need to keep that in mind. So let's talk about a couple of three different ways that people uh, learn, various mechanisms that people learn. We're doing really well on time. The first one is mobile learning. Mobile learning, uh, the hyperlinked library, and that's this model of uh, the future evolving library that I use in my teaching, offers collections and access anywhere. Pew Internet in American Life, a couple years ago, talked to uh, experts globally, said, what's the future of the internet? And they said the mobile device will be the primary connection tool to the internet for most people by 2020. I think it's going to be sooner than that. I'm looking out at all the devices in this room right now, and it's no big deal. I'm glad they're here. That's how we're connected. Now, this, a few years ago, there were a lot more laptops, and now it's the tablets and the other things with the screens and all of that. There are now 6 billion active cell phones. And I love this. I love this. This is a study that AOL and BBDO did where they, the, they looked at how people use their phones and they gave them descriptors. I love this. The, the top thing that people do, 46% of the time we spend on our phones is, are you ready? Where'd it go? Me time. Right? Doesn't that make sense? Followed by uh, socializing, shopping. OK, yesterday at the United Club, at O'Hare. I'm sitting there for four hours. A man came in. People do the craziest things when they're traveling. He came in. He sits down over, opposite me. He takes off his shoes. I get that. OK, that's fine. Then he took his socks off. <laughs> and he rolled up his, his trousers. I love to say the word trousers. And then he just kind of sat there and he did toe exercises. <laughs> I was like, what is this? If you follow me on Instagram or Twitter, you can actually see a photograph <laughs> of the offending person. I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, I would, I would put that either into he was having me time, I was having socializing time, which probably. He was having you time. Yeah, because I was just dumbfounded by that. Bless his heart. OK, so anyway. <laughs> Shopping, accomplishing, preparing for things, discovery, and self-expression. The thread that I see running through all of these, including me time, is we're learning throughout all of these. I would say maybe not online banking, maybe, maybe, but a lot of these, there's a little thread of learning going through them. <laughs> the British Library has done a really good job of taking their collection and putting it out. This is the historic map collections, one of my favorite apps. I can look at historic maps. I can swoop around them. I can see them in high definition scans. And then there's the library that misses the point or misses the opportunity to do something really cool. A couple years ago, I saw a film at the Traverse City Film Festival that used a song from the 1960s. It's one of those great songs. It was very famous. It was a mystery, southern gothic type song. And I got kind of hooked on it, obsessed. You get it in your brain. Buy it on iTunes, Google it, find out everything you can. And I came across somebody saying, well, you know, at the University of Blah Blah in a southern state, we're not going to pick on them, they have five legal pad pages from the original songwriter writing the original full song with verses that are crossed out. I know. I thought, oh my goodness, I want to see this. So I started looking around at that university's library online. Couldn't find it. So I turned to Twitter, to my uh, folks that follow me on Twitter, and I asked them a question. Does anybody know where this is? It's making me crazy. I should be able to find it. Somebody wrote back and said, here's one page. They have one page not on a web page associated with the library in any way, but just out there somewhere. OK, don't get mad at me. I played the professor card. And I emailed the university archivist. And I said, well, I'm kind of interested. I'm a professor. Really would like to see this. I'm a professor. 
And I got back a reply that said, oh, no, we can't put those pages online due to issues of preservation and copyright. Hmm. And it stops there. I would argue the most unique, interesting, cool thing you have in your collection is the thing you need to put in everybody's hand. Okay. The most unique thing you have is what everybody wants to see. At Traverse Library, we have a huge, and this is my hometown library, so I talk about them a lot. We have a huge collection of vintage up north historical postcards. They have made those postcards available online for people to see them that way as well. We'll take just 10 seconds to go back, and usually somebody's like, wait, what song was it? Yeah, Ode to Billy Joe. Yeah, I heard it over here. The, the title is Ode to Billy Joe. Absolutely. Why did he jump off the bridge? What did they throw off of the bridge? What were they talking about over the dinner? Anyway, think about ways then that the library can always be within reach. And I know some of you are even going down that road for your project. So now let's talk a little bit about connected learning. And this is one of my favorite things. The hyperlink library gives users a way to learn and connect. And I have an example I'm going to share with you today. I'm really uh, excited about this. This is something we did last fall. Uh, I taught a, a version of the hyperlink library course that I teach for San Jose SLIS as a massive open online course for library professionals on a global scale. It turned out to be a great, chaotic adventure. And it was a lot of fun. So who has taken um, a MOOC? A MOOC? Oh, wow, great. Great, wonderful. OK. There's a couple of different kinds of MOOCs. Massive open online course, again, for the room. There's the X MOOC and the C MOOC. The X MOOC is that sort of typical uh, the way university classes have been structured for a very long time, you listen to a lecture, you might read a little something, you might take a quiz, and then you're done with that chunk and you go on to the next. And I see it, personal opinion, as a very solitary activity, maybe with a little bit of interaction um, within uh, discussion forums. A C MOOC is a connectivist MOOC. And that's built on participation, it's built on what the community of learners brings to the, the platform and what they share. And that's the type of MOOC that we taught. And we based it on uh, these concepts. And these are things we've actually, again, we've heard about today. Play. We can make sense of things via experimentation. Absolutely. Reflection. We explore our reaction to ideas by blogging. Now, you all are going to be blogging, so this is a big deal. I have had my students blog for years. Uh, I wrote my dissertation on librarians who write blogs and what that, what that did for them. So uh, blogging as a reflective tool can be very important. <coughs> we had folks come in from every continent except Antarctica. Antarctica. Uh, we had 363 people. So that may not be. Uh, a definition of massive, like 20,000 people in a MOOC. But we had a lot of people. And uh, it was very interesting to see how they exchanged ideas, how they approached this. Uh, we came together again with a shared purpose, that they would learn about the hyperlink library model. It would be production-centered. And I was thinking about this as, as the uh, uh, we were doing the first session this morning. And this is very much what you all are doing, I think. I think it's connected learning. Uh, assignments are practical artifacts, such as a technology plan for this. For you all, it is making something happen. So important. And it is openly networked. Our MOOC was wide open for the world to see and participate in. And we actually had librarians and authors and other people come in from outside and uh, participate as well. Very quickly, I'm going through a massive amount of data. Just very quickly, some of the takeaways. 76% of the people that took the course said they were successful. Not that many finished, because people don't finish MOOCs. That should not be the way we gauge success. 
Uh, takeaways included uh, learning about new ideas. They networked with each other. I love this one. They learned about themselves. They learned about how they learn. They learned about where their comfort zones are, and they learned how to push them a little bit. So interesting. And they gained a renewed outlet, outlook for the profession. Uh, this made me happy. It brought back uh, one of my favorite quotes from A New Culture of Learning, where imaginations play, learning happens. So giving a space like you all will have over the next few months to play and experiment can be so important. It might be putting up a user manifesto on the wall of the academic library. And again, this is from Brian Matthews, where instead of putting up all the rules of what people can't do, quiet in the library and all of that, create and innovate, always add value, encourage others to express their thoughts. Those kind of encouraging things are what we need. It might be a creation and making session in a library where people come together and learn from each other and they make something new. So, how do we get started? We need to learn to learn and we should be doing this constantly. And guess what? You all are in absolutely the right place. Professional development in libraries, let's go back a little bit. I started in libraries in the mid-90s. It was very much, uh, you go to a day-long workshop. You might do some reading. You might go to a conference. I was very lucky to go to my first ALA in 1995 in Chicago, and I was just really blown away by how exciting it was. Um, and then in the mid-2000s, mid along came Learning 2.0 which brought all that kind of professional development stuff we were doing, and there were some webinars thrown in there too, brought this to library staff all over very easily and at little or no cost. And the original Learning 2.0 looks like this. This has been one of my research areas. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what I've discovered in uh, talking and doing surveys with people who have been through this program, 23 Things or Learning 2.0. How many of you in the room did this in the last few years? Nice. Uh, here's some of the things that we, we found out doing uh, studies in Australia and then in the United States. Uh, a higher degree of confidence. 53%, 36% agree, strongly agree, said, I'm confident I can learn new technologies after doing this program. That's a big deal. I'm comfortable, same numbers. And then a little bit less, I like to explore technology on my own. I did a pilot study of three Illinois libraries uh, last year that I just wrote up for reference and user services quarterly. And uh, the same ideas rose to the top. And it, that said to me that this is a model that works. For those of you that are looking for inspiration to help your constituents learn as part of your projects, this might be a model to look at very seriously. I also think uh, the MOOC model might be useful as well. Highland Park Public Library up north, I spoke at their staff development day a few years ago. They took Learning 2.0 into the physical space and had areas around the library set up where people could go and they could learn. They could put their hands on an e-reader, and maybe some people in the library hadn't done that, and they had a passport that when you did that table, that kiosk, you got a stamp. You fill your passport, you get put in for a drawing. Yay, everybody likes prizes, right? A little bit of an incentive uh, to learn. So that's how I think Learning 2.0 is sort of permeated out. And into the mix then in the last couple of years comes Mobile 23 Things. Has anybody seen this one? Yay, OK, boy, that hand went up, yay. OK, a librarian I know in Denmark said, well, I want to do 23 things, but I want to do it on mobile devices, and I want to do it for apps. And he created the program. His name is Jan Holmquist. Partnered with him, and we did pre and post surveys of that library staff. Just wrote that up as well. And again, the outcomes are so positive, and I think I have a, a slide up and coming. As his program was still going on, uh, created just for his library in Denmark, he partnered with a group of librarians in Australia and New Zealand, and they translated the program into English and put it out for the world to use for free. This is such a big deal. 
So here it is. This is uh, one of the, the biggest offerings. This is the Australia New Zealand 23 mobile things. This launched before Jan's program was done. And they thought, oh, we'll have a few people from Australia and a few New Zealanders. They had 700 people register that quickly and move through the, the 23 things. So here's what we pulled uh, from Jan's library. I asked a series of questions about using mobile applications before and then after. After is the white. I have no understanding at all, and I need others to use technology for me, all the way up to I have a high understanding. After the program, those first two, the I have no understanding and I have a limited understanding, those rolled off. And it all moved up here. And I'm really pleased with that 58%. I have a fair understanding. And I can chat about things. To me, that means they are on their way. And they're, hopefully, they will continue to have access to tablets, to mobile phones, and be actively using uh, the applications in their library work. So that's a way to get started. If you haven't done one of these programs, might be something to think about. If you hadn't heard about 23 mobile things, it might also be something to think about as well. And again, the model itself, I think, is very pliable and can be replicated. And then there's also the concept of the personal learning network. Everyone here in this room and the time you're going to spend together this week, that's part of your personal learning network. Your team, your personal learning network. The blogs you read the tweets you read, the people you follow on Twitter, the people you follow on Facebook, all of that becomes part of your personal learning network. So Twitter, and they just did that thing where you could see your first tweet. Did anybody do that? Did you look at your first tweet? So it used to be Twitter was, what are you doing? Or here's the guy that took his shoes off at the airport. You know, <laughs> silly stuff like that. But beyond all that, you can find on Twitter specifically, a wealth of information and sharing going on all centered around what are you learning. So if you haven't dabbled in Twitter, I think this is a really good time to start. Uh, there's a couple hashtags I think folks are using. What is it? I lead and then I lead USA. So they're I lead you, I lead USA. So there's a couple. Uh, follow those on your device just to see what people are saying. And what I would say for you all, is the hyperlink librarian builds a thriving, evolving personal learning network, <coughs> sharing and participating. And this, to me, is continuous learning. We give a lot of lip service to continuous learning in libraries. Lifelong learning, lifelong learning. What does that mean? What does that mean for you all as professionals? I think it starts with us. It starts with us taking control of our own professional development. And look at where you're at. Yay for you for finding your way to this program. This, this is like the ultimate in taking control of your own professional development. This is a big deal. Now what I advocate for is professional development with teeth in libraries. And for the administrators in the room, this is serious. I'm going to talk to you for a second. We need to put it into people's job descriptions that they're expected to be learning constantly. That should be part of their jobs. I appreciate the folks in the back nodding. <laughs> if you are given the chance to learn, and again, how wonderful for you all to have this opportunity, you take it and you run with it. And you be a model for the other people back at your institution don't be obnoxious about it, right? But just be excited and model the fact that you have a great opportunity to learn. Once we do this, then we need to teach everyone. And I really appreciate the projects I read about that are looking outward to help constituents, patrons, users, clients, members, whatever you want to call them, help them learn in various ways, in school libraries, in the public library, in the academic library. Because one of the things we do and we should be doing is teaching people how to make sense of the world and how to get along and how to participate and how to be a part of all this stuff that's going on. 
So infinite learning, then, is what I think we're hurtling toward. And I think libraries can be at the center of that. We have such great, great potential. For example, I would like to see associations, state libraries, yay, and consortia offer and support more large-scale learning. I would like to see more of these global opportunities offered. You guys got a great model here. Keep going with it. Make it bigger. Make it bigger. Make it global. For my part, the hyperlinked library MOOC will be offered again in spring 2015. I would invite you all that are interested to come and take a look and potentially join us for a global group of folks that are going to experience some chaos and hopefully come out on the other side with some cool ideas. I can also see a library being a threshold for online learning. How might we do that? How might that happen? It might be, uh-oh, wait a minute. I looked at the wrong slide. Sorry, looking at that one. Rewind a little bit. Sorry, rewind, rewind. OK, the library can, <laughs> the library can awful, also offer its users online courses taught by who? Community experts. Who in the community knows the, the great, cool things about certain topics? The experts. Pull them in. Do a loop, a local open online course for your constituents. You might even do a handful of them. They might be little bits and pieces that you can put together and learn about all sorts of things. Sorry about that. Consider how the library might be a threshold for online learning, and I, that resonated with me when I read over the stuff. Consider a, it just went out of my brain, a Spock, a, help me out somebody, Spock, secure, boy, that, I, and I had it up there, I, I wow. We'll have to look that up, somebody look that up, the Spock, can't believe it, totally out of my brain. There is secure in there somewhere. I don't remember what the, the P is for. Online course. This is a, this is like a reference quiz. So, sorry? Small private online course. Yes, well done. Thank you. A, yes, absolutely. A small private online course. Where it doesn't have to be 363 people or 20,000 people. It could be 30 people that you pull together and you help them learn about a certain topic. It might, maybe the P becomes an O. Maybe it's open as well. It, it doesn't matter. But consider the Spocks and the Souks and the different uh, models. And beyond all of this, I think librarians should support learners in our spaces and online as much as possible. What does that mean? That means that you may have somebody come into your library and say, Hi, I'm taking a MOOC on blah, blah, whatever MOOC they're studying. Medieval literature. And I have to make a video. And I don't know how to do that. Can you help me? And you know what the answer is? Yes, I can help you because it's what we do here at the library. So let me show you the digital media lab. Or let me show you the computer where we show people how to edit video. There are also, these are the potential. I think there's great potential, but there's also great reality. For example, uh, a library that has open lab time and art classes uh, with their, inside of their new Create, Connect, Collaborate space. And those are great words to use about a, a library space. Uh, White Plains Public Library in New York State did a program for teens where they were given those little little uh, boards with computers on them, those little chip things. They loaded them up. They made them work. They put applications on them. And then everybody got to take one home. They, and one of the goals of this program was they wanted teens to experience technology-based learning. It's a big deal. Uh, this is great. The uh, Better Technology On-Site and Personal Express takes informa information literacy training to various libraries in the service area, uh, Niagara, Orleans, and Genesee counties in New York State. 
So not every library has the internet trainer in the big training room, but the portable training room finds its way around and helps folks. The Hunt Library in North Carolina State University uh, just opened a new building. And one of the things they did, and this really to me is an example of uh, participation uh, by everyone, they had a, uh, a contest on Instagram where you could tag a photo of how you experience the library with their hashtag up there, uh, give it the tag, and then it becomes part of a rotating collection, exhibit, participatory environment inside of the library, these Instagram photos display. They also chose one as the best, and they gave that person a prize and took their picture and put them on the web and everything. But this is incredible. This is just a tiny little participatory thing, but I think it can go such a long way for engaging people in the library and helping them see what's possible inside of the four walls as well as virtually. Uh, Escondido Public Library out in California, they have Library U, and they are going to the experts in the community, and they find uh, folks that know something about, for example, um, uh, this person, the story of Sakato and drawing, don't know exactly what that is, but that person is an expert. They do a video, they put it up on the library U site, and this becomes part of the library's collection as well. Involving the community, whoever the community is that you serve, in adding to and enhancing the learning opportunities of everyone is something we should think very seriously about and we should put in our, into our strategic plans. New York Public Library has an, a huge collection of material. One thing they have is the World's Fair 1939. Multiple, multiple neat things to look at, all digitized. They made an app, a nice iPad app that lets you flip through it, swoosh around, and learn about it. Again. The most unique things you have in your collection should be the things that you put in people's hands. Los Angeles Public Library. Uh, all eyes are turning out there right now when we talk about learning in libraries. They are initiating a program to help people get their high school diplomas. The Los Angeles Public Library's Career Online High School is going to get people their diploma online. And I met their director, and he is so fired up about learning in the library, new models of learning. This is one uh, to take a look at. Our friends in Australia, down in Queensland, Australia, have been running a 2.0 learning program for the public for years. They've been very successful. Monthly modules go up. It's called Looking at 2.0, Free Online Guide to Using Web Technologies. Totally helping people learn about the next new thing. The, the, the neat thing about this is it's so adaptable. When Instagram comes out and gets super popular, they make a module, they put it up, and then it's part of that library of learning objects. From our friends up north in Chicago, I've been watching uh, UMedia very closely. They are expanding to six more Chicago public libraries are going to have UMedia spaces. Who's been to UMedia? Probably a few folks, yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool to see what's going on uh, with young people and exciting them uh, about technology and uh, 3D printers. And then there's the little libraries. I love the little libraries. I talked about this last time I was here for On the Front Line. I'm a steward of a little library in northern Michigan, and it's been one of the best things I've ever done. Um, not a lot of technology involved until somebody sent me a library box and we plugged that in and now there's uh, Wi-Fi materials that people can download uh, uh, there at the Little Free Library, but it has been so much fun. And I think this is another example of learning everywhere. Putting little libraries out on the neighborhood levels for people to discover things and to learn. Okay, so what about us? What about us? Gonna get a little bit of my water. How are we doing? We're doing really well on time. You guys all right? Okay. All right. Yeah, you, you seem to be doing well, and I'm talking a lot, so 
We're going to wind up here and we'll do some questions. I, I appreciate your attention. So what about us? In the MOOC, in the hyperlink library MOOC that I taught, we did a post-survey. Got some great data. One of the things we said is, so you've taken a MOOC. What role do you see librarians playing in future MOOCs? And here's what we found out. Number one, librarians will be guides. They will show people how this stuff works. They will show them resources. They will offer to them uh, a means to go forward and make sense of the chaos, if you will. Number two, access provider. They will provide access to the resources that people need to take their MOOCs or whatever MOOCs become, whatever online education becomes, we will be there providing access. And guess what? We will also be creating online learning, large scale, small scale, and all those things in between. <laughs> we will be an instructor. We will teach people how to do things so they can create their artifacts for their learning. I run my mouth about this a bit. And I was interviewed by LJ, Library Journal, for a piece on MOOCs. And I said, yeah, I think this is, this is going to be a thing. And I think in public libraries and academic libraries, and maybe even in school libraries, we will be helping people that are augmenting, supplementing their learning online in large scale classes. We will be helping them. And I think that's something we do, right? And I had a comment. Somebody commented and it was directed at me on the on LJ site and said, well, Michael has obviously lost touch with his public library roots. I said, Wait a minute. They said, because we can't be expected to know everything that these people are going to ask us. That doesn't fly in my world. I know, I know. And it's one of those anonymous, you know, those anonymous commenters. It's fine. It's fine. Guess what? If somebody comes in and is across the desk from you and says, hi, I need help with blank. Are we going to be those people that say, well, can you tell me what this is for? And do you pay taxes in this district? And can you show me your ID or something crazy like that? That's not going to happen. We're always going to be there to help. It's just now the opportunities for learning are not just the school project, maybe just here in our town. It could be something much larger and global. And finally, we're going to be a connector. We're going to help people connect with other people to learn. And this doesn't stop, and you're again, you're in the right place. Always, we're going to be a learner. A lot of the people in our MOOC said, I took this MOOC because I wanted to see what being in a MOOC was like. That is totally a great reason to do it, because I wanted to see what it was like. If you haven't signed up for a large online course, try it. See what it's like. See where your place might be in a future where these opportunities are everywhere. When I think about the future, and when I think about where we will be, what I see across all types of libraries, that's all types of libraries, the librarian will be the community learning connector. And for those of you that are looking for, for ways in your projects to help people learn, your constituents, think about that title. Think about what that means. What it means to support learners on platforms that offer endless opportunity. OK. So back to the shameful post that we started with, that I want to get rid of all the librarians, and I want to put in friendly people, <laughs> and people that know how to use technology. Well, to me, that was a call for better librarians. How do we become better librarians? We consistently, constantly are learning. To me, it's a call to arms to think strategically about our spaces, about our services, and learning. Which brings me to this. We talked a lot about technology, got a lot of technology in the room. But I want you to remember, and especially as you work on your projects and you meet and you interact and you learn from each other, each other over the next three days. And, and again, what a cool, cool thing. Remember that it isn't about the technology. It's about people. So keep the heart involved and understand that the hyperlink library uses technology in a mindful way to engage the heart, the mind, and the spirit. 
All three of those things are very, very important. Transformative learning is an active process involving thought, feelings, and disposition. There are feelings involved in the way people learn. The hyperlink library has heart at its center. And this, this, what I've taken almost an hour to tell you all, one of our students in the MOOC last semester said it in like these few words. Only humans can create, curate the stories, the interactions, and the user experiences that make up the hyperlinked library. That's exactly what it is. It's stories, it's interactions, and it's a human conversation. I love this example. This is our friends down in Christchurch, New Zealand. They just opened a new, new library, yay for them, after two devastating earthquakes. But they have consistently um, used Twitter to reach out to their community and to talk to them. And the thing they do is they put their photographs. See those nice six faces there on the side? That's the six people that are in charge of the Twitter account. And if Brendan up there tweets, he signs his tweet with his initials. So you know who's tweeting. I love that. I want to see the human face of the library. I know some people just, whatever reason, legal reason, you can't have your photo up for people to find. But for the most part, if somebody says, let's put our photos up on our Twitter, do it. Because I want to see the human face of the library. And your users want to see the human face of the library as well. So as we go forward, and we encounter all these different ways that technology can hold us back, and can be roadblocks, it can be a problem, can keep us under siege. We must never, ever forget, and this is Stephen Barnes, I love this quote, that the human heart is at the center of the technological maze. Please remember that amidst all the chaos. So what next? Very quickly, and then we'll open it up to questions. This is the lightning round. <laughs> Administrators, hold on. Wait, everybody, sorry, <laughs> reverse. I, my eye, I must, I'm reading backwards today. Everyone, make time for learning and exploration. Guess what? You're here in this program. You're going to be doing it. Administrators, give time. Beyond this, this, this program, if you're an administrator in the library, if you're a manager, give time to your employees to learn. Flipping through library journal on a reference desk shift is not professional development in the 21st century. Okay? It should be active, exploratory learning, a project, something connected to other folks. And always be learning. Never stop. After this program is done, look for the next thing. Sign up for the, the Spock or the MOOC or the Luke or whatever. Find mobile 23 things. Watch the horizon for those next technologies that are going to be out there. We're going to be like, hmm, what's that? How'd that get on that list? What does that mean? And break down barriers. Think of the barriers you can break down to get information, learning, into the hands of your constituents, wherever they happen to be, and value everyone. <laughs> Everyone that comes into your doors. Oh, you're, no, you're not a part of our service area. I can't help you. Oh, you're taking a MOOC sponsored by another university. I can't help you. Those are barriers. And be nice to each other. If you've seen me talk in the last few years, and I, gosh, it's been seven years ago, I spoke at ILA here in Springfield. And I did my litany of bad library signs. If you've ever seen those, guess what? People are still putting those up. I was down in Missouri. And I'm walking around this library. And I met this neat librarian. She had an iPad. And she's like, can I help you? I said, oh, are you doing roving reference? And we had a neat talk about, she's like, yeah, this is, we're trying this out. We got iPads. And we're meeting people in the stacks. It's so exciting. And it was just so cool. So then I leave her. And I walk into the reference area, and I'm confronted by this gigantic sign that says, cell phones prohibited. It's like, wait, no, no. Think about your policies, especially related to technology, and think about how you talk to, to your users with your signage. And be human. That's a good thing to remember, too, when you're making a sign. Be human. 
and know that it is okay to fail. That is how we're going to learn. It's okay to talk about things you tried and it didn't work out so well. Don't be shy about that part. Invite everybody in to help you plan and to help you learn. And take risks. I went to an incredible conference in September of 2012 in Colorado called the Risk and Reward Conference. It was this crazy, out of the ordinary library conference that maybe 400 people went to because it was so far away from anything you couldn't even get there. This is what the organizers wore on their backs. Sometimes better safe than sorry may be the danger, sorry, better safe than sorry may be the most dangerous thing ever said. Take <coughs> risks. As you plan your project and you work with your group members, remember a couple things. Remember chaos. And it may seem kind of uncomfortable. And you may feel like you're out of your comfort zone and you may want to run away. That's OK. That happens. Remember chaos. But also remember to take some risks and to push those boundaries a bit. Be creative. Be as creative as possible. And please, bring your hearts with you to the work you do. And focus on the heart as you work on your projects. I wish you the absolute very best as you embark on this journey. So thank you. And we have time for questions, right? Yay, we did. 1045. Yay. Thank you. OK. Questions, concerns, worries, freak out moments. What do you think? Yes? Our job has doubled because mm -hmm. while we have to while we have to do these things, we also can't forget the people who are never going to have a smartphone. Right. We have to continue to serve them. Right. We should, but I would also say we will serve them as long as they come in the doors. That will be a given, and we have doubled our work, and so some things are eventually going to have to roll off. And that's what doing like looking at processes and all of that, and finding those things that really don't have a lot of impact. Get those out, but. Any opportunity we can take for the folks that may never have a, a smartphone, but they might be really curious about it, what could we do for them that might give them some insights that they never would have? And maybe they'll never, for whatever reason, be able to afford it or ever want one or ever care. It might be good just to spend an hour kind of thinking about it or talking with it with a group of people. Money is what me. That, that, that there are people who won't afford that, and right. we're only going to serve the people who will. Right. Right, but I would say that, for the, and, the, and it's a very realistic thing, the, the techno isolation, the rural communities, the whatever, wherever you happen to be, I think the library should be a place for people to put their hands on the same technology that all the fancy people can afford in the other communities. It should be there and it should be available to them. So that, that, that's absolutely, to me, like a digital divide definition that we can, we can break down. Other thoughts? Yes. Um, I'm speaking from, I'm thinking from more of an administrative standpoint and yeah. thinking about bringing a team of people who work at the state or at a higher level to have the same kind of risk taking or, you know, more aggressive learning kind of mind frame. Um, and I think an encouraging way of approaching this without, you know, terrifying those traditionalists who feel very much like they're losing their footing right. when you're bringing up these ideas is, um, you know, there's a lot of new ideas, but nested within these new ideas are things that libraries have all, all, always done, but just using nomenclature that's really Absolutely. isolationary, you know, like oral histories, you know, what does that mean? But watching a video about some a subject matter expert who knows about the toe sucking stories or whatever, you know, <laughs> yeah. that is a form of that, but it's just, it reaches out to the community more. So I feel like that's, that's a, a good bridge for people. To say. Absolutely. This is, not, this is not completely radical from what we've always done. It's just a way of presenting it to. If you go back to those core values, and I really appreciate you making this point, and I have slides that I, when I do real long presentations, core, like stewardship, what does stewardship mean? Oh, that's, oh we, we take care of the books. Oh, yay. What does stewardship mean in the 21st century? It's, to, it's a very different thing. And it could be uh, the, the library in Alexandria in Egypt 
gathering all the thousands and thousands of tweets that happened during the uprising and making those available as a collection. So absolutely, if we, if we think about our mission and our values as a profession and do that first, and for your projects, seriously, you know, it's not just, ooh, cool, mobile phone, neat. No, it should do something that makes sense in people's lives. Put people first, as we've always done in libraries, I would hope, and then surround them with those uh, foundations. Yes? So um, we've all experienced learning moments where um, something we learn something because it didn't turn out the way that we thought it was going to, and we're frustrated. And I'm wondering what your experience has been um, dealing with that moment of frustration in a learner as a facilitator of that learning. And then also, how does that scale up, or does it? And what, 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 what do you think about the nature of MOOCs and stuff like that and handling the sort of intimate part-based reaction? What a great question. That is a three-part question. OK. <laughs> Ask the first one again. Uh, well, the first one is about just from a, from a librarian's role in handling that, that moment. OK, thank you. A couple of things. I would hope and I would aim for our staff, you as a librarian, for the people around you, for your, ooh, for your, the, your people over you, that they have created an encouraging envir an environment where failure is OK, all right? I have been on both sides of that. I have been crushed as a librarian because I've made a mistake. And let me tell you, I still think about those times that I was crushed. But I also have had mentors and people that I worked with, and they might be my supervisor, that were so encouraging that I think that's, that's where a lot of my stuff that I talk about, like let's, let's remember that we're all people, and let's remember that we're human, and that, that, that it is a lot about the heart, that we should be nice to each other. And I'm, I'm never, th and I think that's found my way into my teaching, I've never, and I know I have students in this room, former students, I hope I was never mean, right? And like scary or like standing up and yelling at you in the, in the room. And, and I've had students email me and say, well, last semester somebody told me I didn't know how to learn. Who would say that to one of our students? That irked me to no end. So it really, it comes down to, I would say, a humanist approach that we should encourage and foster in our institutions. That's a really long answer to the first part. Um, what was what was the rest of it? I'm sorry. So the second part, part is then how do we take that um, very kind of intimate one to one mm -hmm. and scale it in something like a movie, uh, or does it? Okay, I okay. I'm going to tell you what I think, and I know we we we're okay okay with time a little bit. I'll tell you what I think about this because I taught a connectivist MOOC with 363 people. Probably by the midpoint, half of those folks were what we would call not as active as the other people. And we might have had 60 to 100 people that were super active. I made a commitment to them to be present. So I think it's possible in smaller settings, 100 people, 200 people, depending on how much support you have, right? I don't think the giant 20,000 people I'm going to watch a video of Michael talking, and then I'm going to write or take a quiz. I don't think there's a space for that there. I don't think that will ever be that way, but I think that could help people learn certain things. Maybe more, I don't even want to qualify that because I don't want to offend anybody that that's their thing or whatever. It just might be different topics than the stuff that I would want to focus on. But I do believe it, it scales. I teach entirely online. I meet with my students synchronously on occasion. A lot of the stuff we do is asynchronous. But when I sit down to record a video, they get a video of me. They get my slides. looks very much like this. And they get my words. And I talk to them like I'm talking to you. And I hope that comes through. And then I'm present within the class. So I really think it comes down to presence to being there. How much presence can we have? Yes, sir. Hi. Thing, uh, you mentioned uh, a lot of uh, 
failing, like basically what, what in the startup world is called failing forward, where you take uh, lessons from lessons, you take uh, lessons from failing uh, rapidly and you're not afraid to do so, and then as long as you fail forward, it's perfectly okay. Um, which I was really happy to hear because I think that's an extremely important uh, concept, not only for people who are learning, but folks who are educating. Mm -hmm. um, you uh, were talking about scaling up in response to uh, Beck's question. One of the things that uh, when I talk to folks who are dealing with 10, 20,000 uh, student MOOCs is that uh, they, they step back a little and they say, don't be afraid to step back and let the students interact with themselves, viewing yourself as the corrector after that discussion has taken place for maybe 30 or 45 minutes, sometimes an hour, sometimes only five minutes. You know, it's the speed of the internet these mm -hmm. days. And so all of a sudden you'll see a, an answer to a question on a forum evolve. And at the end, instead of writing the one paragraph or one page answer to a complicated query, you only have to correct one thing and vote up someone else's answer. So you can uh, scale it in that way. I was wondering if you had some, some thoughts on that. Well, that, that's great, uh, and I like I like your use of vote up. I think that's important. I think I would like to see more voting up. Um, in the in the in the, again the experience that I had with this this MOOC that we taught, it took on a life of its own, and it went way beyond. Uh, I had a co-instructor what we were doing. Uh, it found its way to Facebook and to Goodreads and all over the web that we we didn't facilitate at all, and I was really really pleased with that. Uh, and I did, in, I had those moments where I would wait, because you, I guess you can be too present. You kind of let, let it spin out, maybe a, a blog post elicited all these comments, then I might come in. Or I might record a video, plug it in there too, so I can just kind of talk that way and address it. But yeah, absolutely. That, that, yeah, I, I experienced that, but I could see the bigger it gets, the more that might be important to let things play out. I just, I always felt guilty that I wasn't, like every day that I wasn't there. So it was, it was a lot to do. Yes? I have yeah. heard of MOOCs before. Is it mm -hmm. something that you take, like you can get like, credit for? Or is it more, you know, like those online classes you take where you could get the CPDUs or whatever the equivalent is in your state? Like how does that? No, that's a great question. That's a wonderful question. Again, a massive open online course, this has been one of the, the trends that came up out of nowhere in the last couple years in the higher ed talk. Um, some MOOCs give you a certificate that says, oh, you've done this and you've learned this. <laughs> other MOOCs you pay and you might come out on the other end with something with more of a credential. Uh, San Jose State University, not my school, but the university did a project where they they ran a bunch of undergrads through a huge MOOC environment to say, oh, we can do, we can do MOOCs for undergrad education. That didn't go so well. <laughs> Our MOOC was totally removed from that. I always say that. We were totally removed. We gave a certificate of completion. I'll tell you, we actually gave 53 to the 363 that originally started. 53 people did all the things they had to do, but still success is gauged in various ways. We also did badges. So, and that was, that was a learning experience for me, giving people badges for different things and what that meant. Some people were like all about the badges <laughs> because it motivated them. Just like getting prizes at staff day. So that, it was very, very interesting. So there's various things that people can get out of it. Those takeaways you saw here, that to me is the most interesting thing. When we talk about large scale learning for professional development, which I think we should see more of in our profession, that's where it gets really interesting to me, that those takeaways, that means, that says to me that it's a model that should be refined and used again and again. Good question, thank you. How are we doing here? One more thought? Are we done? Yes, sir, sorry. How would you handle the reluctance to learn somebody that you might have dragged kicking and screaming into the 21st century? Mm -hmm. The re okay, the question is, how would you handle the reluctant learner? Okay, kill them with kindness, okay? Pair them up with somebody that might carry them along a bit. Find the thing that they're most interested in and make the learning about that in a kind of a roundabout way to get to what you want them to learn, right? But now here's the serious part. Professional development with teeth means 
If it's in your job description and you're not doing it, it may be time for you to go. Because sometimes we're super nice, right? In our profession, we're super nice. But if we say we're a learning organization, I think we need to get behind that and be very serious about it. And that's the kind of, I don't, I'm sorry to end on such a kind of a downer thing, but I think it's something to look at very seriously. And to go back to your question, if we couch that as, yeah, we are a learning organization and we will encourage you and support you and be nice as much as possible, but it's on you to learn, that's a way to go forward without it being so mean. Yes? You were talking about gaming, and it's like a lot of times um, working like with kids, it's like, yes, you can game or you can do something fun, but you're also responsible for learning. And that's, I'm really curious how this whole gaming thing is going yeah. to learn. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, especially with, with children. And yeah, wow, okay. We'll, we'll talk about it. I will be back at 4, 3.50 for the wrap thing. So I'll be around, and I'll be, I'm here all day. If anybody wants to talk, we can talk about that further. But I think my time is slipping away. So, oh, OK. I'm also thinking I'm <laughs> crumpled on the floor here. But yeah, we, we, will, we can talk about this some more. I think that's really, really interesting, the gamifying, which I've heard some people really blast that word as not being a good word to use but making more gameful experiences for people, and especially for young people, uh, as a way to sort of pull in new skills. But then, if you also think, you know, putting a bunch of kids in a room, sorry, and saying, let's build something together, let's build something that does whatever, that, that's kind of a game too. And that's that DIY thing that everybody's talking about, that that can be so powerful. And I don't remember, being a kid, having that much opportunity to do all the cool things that kids can like put their hands on the, right now. It's incredible. All right, I'm going to stop talking. I need to drink some more water. I really appreciate your attention this morning. I wish you the very best for your projects. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. All right.